I'm Robin Bernstein, and I am the author of Freeman's Challenge, The Murder That Shook America's Original Prison for Profit. Yeah, and thank you for joining us. Um, I would love for you to begin by telling us how you came to this project and um, what, if anything, you learned from the research and, and writing. Sure. Well, I came to the project by accident. I was looking for something else, and that is very often how historians find their projects. So um, I, I stumbled upon the case because I was interested in the history of the criminalization of Black youth. And I, um, as I was researching that, I became particularly interested in the 1840s, and the case popped right up because it was extremely well known at the time. And the deeper I dug into it, the more important the story became. And I knew that, so at first I thought this story was going to be a chapter in a different book. And then the deeper I dug, the clearer it became that this had to be its own book. So um, in terms of what I learned, oh, I learned so much. Um, the book transformed how I think about prisons. And my hope is that it will transform how some readers think about prisons. Uh, when I started writing the book, I, I could be described as um, probably a pretty typical liberal when it came to um, prisons. I thought that prisons were bad and there should be fewer of them. I thought that prisons were racist and um, there should be less racism in the criminal justice system. Um, I thought that prisons should be, I basically thought that prisons should be fewer, um, non-racist and more humane. And that's a basic liberal perspective. Um, by the time I reached the end of the book, I had a very different perspective. By the time I finished the end of writing the book, I had a very different perspective. What I realized was that the sense that prisons are inevitable and necessary, which is absolutely a sense that I admit to having when I started writing the book, the sense that prisons are, are inevitable and necessary was something that people believed in Auburn practically before the prison was even built. I realized that this idea that prisons are necessary has been instilled in me and instilled in everybody, many, many people that I know. Um, it's been instilled over 200 years and it's been instilled by people who don't care that much about justice. It's been instilled by people who care about enterprise and capitalism and business. And once I came to realize that, I, I realized that the onus should be on prisons to justify their continued existence rather than on prison abolitionists to justify ending prisons. Yeah, and I, I think that's such an interesting point because the the story begins very much in the prison. And then um, it also creates, in a way, what follows when William Freeman, who you follow through his, incar his initial incarceration, his release, his horrific murder and then his reincarceration, the um, the way in which the prison structure was very much um, a catalyst for creating William Freeman, the murderer, not only in his mind but also in behavior. And I would love for you to to tell us what Auburn Prison was, is, continues to be, and. Um, how William Freeman and other prisoners, especially everyone in there, um, lived. What was what was prison life like in Auburn Prison in eighteen forties? Sure. So um, the Auburn State Prison was America's original prison for profit, and what I mean by that is that it was the prison that invented the idea that a prison could be an economic enterprise as its root. Um, not incidentally, but that the purpose of a prison could be the central foundational purpose of a prison could be to make money and to make money and to be an economic stimulus. And this is, of course, something that we all live with today. I mean, if, if, if you want to establish a prison, a new, if you want to build a new prison in a town somewhere, what's your argument going to be? Your argument is going to be... Um, this will bring jobs. This will be good for the local economy. That is an argument that originated in Auburn, New York in 1816. Uh, this, was a, this was an idea that was created, and it was created by businessmen, by white businessmen who lived in Auburn. Auburn is was, at the time, a tiny little village um, in the Finger Lakes region of New York State. And 
these entrepreneurs got the idea to um, establish a state prison that would um, absorb state money that was available and that this state money would grow the village into a city. And that is exactly what happened. So um, so it was it was a um, it was a paradigm shift in American carcerality. So that's that's what the Auburn State Prison was, and it is still open today. It is now called the Auburn Correctional Facility. It is the oldest continuously operating uh, maximum uh, security prison in the United States. It continues to be a source of manufacturing, and that's something I should have said in the beginning was that um, uh, one of the things that distinguished the Auburn State Prison was that it had, from the very beginning, it had um, factories built into it. And in fact, the prison was deliberately built on the banks of a powerful river. And the purpose of building it on that outlet was to provide water power. And that was actually explicit in the deed that it was going to provide water power for factories. So the factories and what they were going to produce was imagined literally before the prison was built. It was imagined into the siting of the business of the prison. They almost said the business and it was a business. So, um, so manufacturing of consumer goods was part of the prison from the very beginning, and manufacturing to this day is still a part of the Auburn, what the Auburn Correctional Facility. Every license plate in New York State is produced in the Auburn State, uh, the Auburn Correctional Facility. So, if you have ever driven a car in New York State that has a New York State driver's, um, a New York State license, if you've ever seen a New York State license plate. That was produced by a prisoner in the Auburn Correctional Facility, which originally, um, 150 years ago, incarcerated William Freeman. Yeah, and, and that that we're going to return to that in a minute. But the um, thing I would like to talk about is when an inmate went into Auburn, um, what was the theory of punishment within the walls of the prison? Because I was struck by how draconian it was and also how monastic it was. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was absolutely draconian. So one thing that's important to say is that there actually was not a theory of punishment for the purpose of justice. So there were other prisons that had this idea that a prison should be punishing because it should be um, it should be uh, writing the scales. A, a person had done wrong and now bad things should happen to that person uh, for the purpose of correcting a balance somehow. And the Auburn State Prison was actually um, in opposition to that idea. In the Auburn State Prison, punishment, discipline, Every every form of control that every form of control and viciousness that you can imagine was was used for the purpose of um, of, of stimulating uh, productivity in the in the in the factories. So the perp so there was terrible violence. There was whipping. There was waterboarding. And uh, William Freeman was whipped. He was waterboarded. He was also beaten horribly with a board, and the board, the that beating was so severe that he sustained a brain injury, and he also lost his hearing. So there was terrible violence and terrible punishment, but it was all for the purpose of serving capitalism, um, of making people work, of making them work harder, making them work faster, and it was all for it was all about money. It was not about um, any sort of abstract concept of justice at all. Yeah, and I, I was really struck by what could cause punishment, like speaking. Inmates weren't allowed to speak to each other. They weren't allowed to look at each other. There was this, and it was all geared toward productivity, as you said. So yeah, I could, I, I could talk a little bit about that if you'd like. Um, so one of the one of the dastardly uh, diabolical innovations of the Auburn State Prison was that it forbid uh, it forbid incarcerated people from speaking to each other ever ever and looking at each other ever. Um, 
people in the Auburn State Prison were incarcerated in individual cells. So they were put into solitary confinement in these individual cells every night. And then every day they were forced to work in factories that were inside the prison. And while they were working in these factories, they could not speak or to each other or look at each other. So in theory, people went for years without ever uttering a word. Um, in reality, there was, of course, uh, resistance. Of course, there was communication. Of course, there was speech. But it was um, punishable. It was pun if, if one was caught uttering a single word that was not directly to a guard in direct response to a question, if you if you spoke a single word beyond that kind of communication, you risked um, beating, whipping, waterboarding. And of course, all of those punishments were in fact meted out and they were meted out to William Freeman. So it's it's an, an extremely brutal and um, torturous kind of existence. Um, William Freeman uh, was incarcerated alongside um, a man named Jack Furman. And um, Jack Furman was the man who was arguably responsible for Freeman being sent to prison in the first place for as punishment for a horse theft that Freeman always claimed he did, was innocent of. And he always claimed that the person who really stole the horse was Jack Furman. So Freeman went into the Auburn State Prison furious at Jack Furman. And Jack Furman, a little bit later, was in a totally separate case, um, also sent to the Auburn State Prison. He was sent to the prison for uh, bigamy, not for, for theft. And they served alongside each other. And when William Freeman was um, liberated from the Auburn State Prison, when he got out, one of the first questions he asked was, where is Jack Furman? Because he wanted to confront Jack Furman. And he found out then that Jack Furman had been incarcerated side by side with him for years, and he didn't know. And the reason he didn't know was that they weren't permitted to look at each other's faces. Let's talk a little bit more about William Freeman, because the book very much is his story. And um, so, as you said, he was convicted of uh, a horse theft that he may or may not have done, or he didn't do. And he enters this environment that we just described as a 15-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. And he emerges a completely different person like eight, eight or nine years later, right? Five, five, five years later. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me kind of what his experience was and how he came out? Sure. So the first thing I'll say is that William Freeman was um, an Afro-Native um, boy. He was 15 years old. Um, he was the grandson of um, a Black couple that founded Black Auburn. So um, he was the grandson of uh, Kate and Harry Freeman, who had been enslaved and forced to build some of the first non-Native homes in Auburn, starting in the 1790s. Um, and while they were building White Auburn, they simultaneously built Black Auburn. They um, were some of the founders of the Black neighborhood, which was called New Guinea. So William Freeman was born into a family that was loved and he was loved. It was He was born into the single most important black family in town. So this is who he was. Um, he also was born into um, a family that was um, affected by the abuse of alcohol. And he was um, born into a family where he lost his father at a young age and his mother uh, really struggled to raise him. When he was 15 years old, as I said, he was accused of stealing a horse. He always insisted that he had not stolen the horse. He was unwavering in that. There was no physical evidence against him. Um, all there was was the word of this other person, Jack Furman, who probably did steal the horse, most likely, although we'll never really know. Um, and, and I should say that we don't actually know for sure whether Freeman stole the horse or not. I personally believe he did not. And part of the reason I believe that is that later on, he after he was um, liberated from the prison, he did in fact steal two horses and he openly admitted that. Um, but he was unwavering in denying stealing the first horse. So I, my belief is that it was true. Um, so he was 15 years old. He had been accused of horse theft. There was no physical evidence against him, just the word of an adult, Jack Furman, uh, an African-American adult. And he was sentenced to five years hard labor in the Auburn State Prison. 
So he goes into this prison. He is he he was freeborn. He was um, as as were all people of his generation in New York. And his father had been manumitted. His father had been born enslaved, but had become free as part of New York State's process of gradual emancipation. His mother had always been free. So he's he's part of this family that had been struggling toward freedom for decades. And all of a sudden he's thrown in the Auburn State Prison where he is forced to work as he put it for nothing. And he is incensed um, and he resists from, from the moment he gets into the prison, he is resisting and he is, um, he is saying that it is unjust to extract his labor for nothing. And he, he meant two things by nothing. He meant no pay. And he also meant no crime. He meant both of those things. And he was explicit about that. So he spent four years um, resisting in the ways that people resist in prison. He resisted by not working very well. He resisted by um, sometimes um, handing in the same work multiple times. This was called playing old soldier, where you would be forced to manufacture something. So you would manufacture it, hand it in, somehow swipe it back and hand it in again. So it looked like you were producing more than you really were. And we should understand this as resistance against the system. The system was robbing him of his labor and he was stealing it back. This was a, a, a conscious um, strategy of resistance or tactic of resistance, and many people in the prison did it, including William Freeman. He also resisted by being funny. Um, he made other people laugh, I, I mean, other incarcerated people laugh, and that was a way of psychically surviving the prison. And again, it was a common practice, and he was a part of that. But ultimately, he resisted most by refusing to work. And, um, and he did that periodically, and he was punished for it. He was punished severely for it. So he was beaten terribly, um, in a, and it crushed his skull, and he was um, brain injured. Um, so he finally gets out of prison at the age of 20. He is now deaf because of the beating. He is now brain injured. He is furious, and he... Um, he is given upon his release, he is given $2. And he thought that that was payment for his work, which was insulting, um, $2 for five years of work. And he demanded more money. Um, he was laughed at. And that's how he left the Auburn State Prison. And this lack of payment became an obsession for him which ultimately led him to commit um, a pretty devastating crime by yes. any, any means of definition. So um, without getting into too much of the, the details, he sought to remedy this pay first through kind of just going confronting and demanding. Yes. And that, that got him nowhere. Yes. Oh. I mean, and, and by demanding it, he tried to he tried to um, organize a legal suit. What he wanted was legal remedy. He was um, seeking out magistrates who he was asking to basically take up his cause and represent him legally. So, yes, he was demanding it, but he wasn't just going and banging on the door. He was trying to get the legal system to work with him and for him. And as you said, it was it was born from two things. One is that he felt that he should be paid for his labor, but also for his time being falsely incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And this became such an obsession to him that he somehow twisted it into violence, right? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly one way to look at it. He, um, he, he tried legally he, and he was dismissed and he was laughed at and he got nowhere. And then at a certain point, the, he he switched over from trying to get back pay to trying to get pay back. He um, and he committed an, a horrific, hor a horrific quadruple murder. And what was so terrible about the murder was not only that it ended four lives um, and not only that it was extremely gory and I will not describe it, although it is described in the book, um, what was so terrifying about that act to the local white people and also to the local black people was that the four people that he killed had no direct relationship 
to the Auburn State Prison or to Freeman's incarceration. So what this meant was that there was no easy narrative to put the murders into. It would have been so comfortable if he had killed the judge who had um, condemned him or if he had killed Jack Furman. You know, that would have been so easy to understand and it would have been bloody and awful. But from the perspective of bystanders, bystanders, it would not have created um, a narrative crisis. It would have been narratively easy. But the fact that he um, killed people who did not have an easy narrative for why, what he kept saying was that the reason he killed them was that he had been incarcerated unfairly, his labor had been stolen for, from him, and somebody had to pay. That's Those were the words that he used. What he was being very clear about was that the murder was an act of terrorism. The, I mean, that's my word, that's a contemporary word, but the murder was an act of terrorism that was um, a violent resistance against the system of prison for profit. But that was a terrifying thing to hear. That was something that nobody in Auburn wanted to hear. And the reason they didn't want to hear it was that the Auburn State Prison was the center of the town. The Auburn State Prison was the economic core of the town. It was also the um, the, 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 the center of the pride of the town. Auburn was the name of the prison. It was the name of the system of prison for profit. And it was the name of the city. So Auburn was the identity of the people. And he was striking a huge blow against that. It was it was also um, the the part of the source of the economic prosperity in the town. So nobody wanted to hear his critique of the prison, no matter how clear he was. And when he folded that critique into a horrifying, terrifying, violent act, nobody could laugh it off. Nobody could simply ignore it, which is what they had done before to his critique. But they didn't want to listen either. They had to find a way to not hear what he was saying. And so what they did was they created their own story to replace what Freeman was very clearly saying. And the story that white Auburnites made up because they had to come up with a reason why he did this. And the reason couldn't be that the prison was unjust, that the prison was generating violence. That couldn't be it. So they had to come up with their own story of why he did this. And of course, the story that White Auburn came up with was that he did it because of blackness itself, that he did it because of um, an essence, a racial essence that was in him and that was in all Black people was the libel. That was the racist story that white Auburnites made up. Yeah, and I want to back up just a minute because I think what um, I was shocked by in the book is that he survives the capture and he wasn't immediately lynched. He wasn't, no. he wasn't there was no prison invasion to grab him. He survives a whole trial and you know eventually dies in prison before sentence is carried out but the but again it was the north and maybe you could speak a little bit about how you know the how he survived to tell this story and how one of the things i was also struck by was locals could just walk into the jail and interrogate him yes and, that, and again you know, normally one would think if white people are entering the jail, it's to grab him and take him out and lynch him. Yeah. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the Northern sensibility and how this story of Black criminality and Black uh, innateness kind of formulated through these interrogations too. Sure, sure. So they did try to lynch him. They tried, um, there were two distinct um, lynching attempts, uh, major lynching attempts. And, um, there, and then there were multiple um, smaller scale lynching attempts. But um, they, the white people in Auburn absolutely tried to lynch him. And um, a huge crowd of people tried to lynch him twice. So, um, and, and we, yeah. Um, so, they both in both times they were they were thwarted by individual um, white people who were associated with the law, 
who basically wanted the rule of law to um, to to take precedence. And so they were not they did not thwart the um, the lynching attempts because they liked William Freeman, and they did not thwart the lynching attempts because they were anti-racist. They thwarted the lynching attempts because they sincerely believed that he should be put on trial, found guilty, and then killed. So um, they they were they they protected him from the lynch mob in order to protect their own ideas about criminal justice. So um, so that's how he survived long enough to be jailed. So um, while he was awaiting trial, he was put in jail and he was uh, put on display. So thousands of people were permitted into the jail. Um, not into the cell, but into the jail. And you have to realize that this jail cell is very small. It's eight feet by eight feet. So when they were, when when spectators were pressing up against the bars, they were very close to him. And he was chained to the floor. Uh, he was injured. Um, and there were, um, so there were thousands of people who came to gawk at him and to scream at him and to throw things at him and to spit on him. Um, and to vent their rage, but they also came to ask him why. And they that was the question that everybody had. And this is the question that this relates to the question that all terrorism provokes by design. Terrorism forces survivors to ask, why did they die and I didn't? Why was it them and not me? And what is particularly disturbing about terrorism is that it provides no easy answer to that question. There was no reason why it was them and not you. Um, you know, why Why was I not in the Twin Towers on 9-11 and other people were? There is no good reason. Um, it could have been otherwise. So that's terrifying. That is really disturbing. And that's part of how terrorism works, by, by terrifying, by not giving easy answers. So people came to the prison, to the to the jail to demand easy answers. They wanted easy answers. They wanted to hear a reason why that they could understand and put in a nice, neat little box and go about the rest of their lives. And of course, he resisted. He um, he kept telling him them over and over why he did it. And that was exactly the answer they could not hear and did not want to hear. So they had to ask again and more. And more, they kept demanding the real reason because they just could not hear what he was actually saying. Yeah, and I wanna um, jump ahead now to the trial because that creates um, two narratives that are incredibly close together, but the defense and the prosecution create a story as to what happened or why it happened. And um, it, I would love for you to tell us how they differed and how they were the same. Sure, sure. So um, he was put on trial. William Freeman was put on trial, and it was called the trial of the half century. It got very big in the news very fast. It made national news. Part of the reason it made national news was that it was so disturbing and so terrifying. But it also made national news because his defense lawyer, was his pro bono defense lawyer was William Henry Seward. Um, Seward had um, very recently been the governor of New York State, and 20 years into the future, he would um, be uh, Abraham Lincoln's secretary of state. If you've ever heard of Seward's Folly, uh, which refers to the purchase of Alaska by the United States, uh, that was William Henry Seward. He brokered that purchase. So you have somebody, so you have the a, a past governor. Um, defending him pro bono. And then on the prosecution side, the prosecution was led by um, uh, 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 by the son of a recent president, um, by John Van Buren, who was the son of Martin Van Buren. So already it's a, ce it's a celebrity trial. And, um, and for all of these reasons, it got um, uh, reported on nationally and repeated. So the Prosecution and the defense had different arguments. The prosecution's argument was um, a straight up racist um, essentialist argument. What he what the prosecution basically argued was that William Freeman killed because he was inherently vicious and he had always been vicious. The prison had nothing to do with it. 
And he um, and the reason that he was vicious was specifically because of his race, um, because of his African American and also Native American heritage. So this was a straight up essentialist um, 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 form of racism. Um, and this is the kind of racism that um, 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 Ibram Kendi calls segregationist racism. Um, so there are there are the races are different. They have different qualities. They have different properties. And um, and and this is just how black people are was the libel um, that the prosecution was making. The defense had a very different argument, and the defense's argument was a relatively new one uh, and novel at the time. The defense argued that the reason William Freeman committed murder was also because of his race, but differently. It was because, according to the defense, he had been so damaged by racism, so damaged by discrimination, that he killed because, as a result of racism, which is just another way of saying that, uh, another way of, of claiming that all Black people are um, prone to criminality, because if racism makes one prone to criminality, and if all Black people and all Native people are subject to racism, then all Black and all Native people in this libel are, sub are, are, libel, are, are more likely to be criminal. So this was a different form of racism, and this is the form that Ibram Kendi would call um, assimilationist. So both of these are uh, both of these forms of racism were being articulated at this moment, and in William Freeman's trial, the assimilationist version of racism that um, that Freeman killed because of um, racial discrimination had traumatized him. Basically, um, that was relatively novel at the time, and as I said, it got repeated over and over. Um, and let me emphasize that Freeman never once said that he killed because he had been treated in a racist way. He never said that. He said he killed because of he because he had been subjected to prison for profit. That's what he said. Um, not in not in those words. He said that he killed because he had been forced to labor for nothing. And um, so the the idea that he killed for reasons that were fundamentally about his experiences of racism, that was William Henry Seward's invention. Yeah, and it and also a component of both sides was this white uh, failure to either control or supervise, right? So on one hand, the prison failed because it, it let him out, and on the other side, the prison failed because it. Um, you know, created this white stewardship failed him. Correct. Yeah, these are these are two forms of of the racist ideas that were um, articulated during the trial. Yes. So of course, uh, the verdict is he's guilty, and his uh, capital punishment is his um, sentence. But he doesn't ever make it to um, execution day. He dies in prison. Correct, and then yeah, he dies in jail. That's right. So there's an interesting, and to me, this is where the uh, story takes on a, a kind of a Manson-like murder uh, afterlife, where there's this kind of industry that builds up around the murder. And I'm thinking of George Matson or Matt, yeah, Matson, um, and also some of the political capital that some of the uh, like the black schools that get funded because of this. So I'd love for you to talk about kind of the afterlife. And I mean, of course, William Freeman is still in jail while some of this was happening. Like he hasn't yeah. executed yet or hasn't died. But talk to me about a little bit about the cultural ramifications of this murder. Sure. Um, so a lot of people rushed in to benefit from the murders. And um, a lot of people rushed in to benefit um, themselves. Uh, one of the people who benefited himself quite handsomely was a, a white reverend named um, John Austin, John Mather Austin. What Austin did was um, throughout the trial cozy up to Seward and make himself a, a an ally to Seward, um, who he had not known before the trial. 
And um, as a result of that relationship, he became a member of William Henry Seward's inner circle. And as Seward's star rose and rose and rose, so did Austin's. Um, during the Civil War, 20 years later, Austin became the paymaster for the Union Army as a direct result of his relationship with um, Seward. So he is an example of somebody who um, uh, benefited ultimately from his uh, manipulation of the trial. So um, so that's one example of a person who benefited. Um, you just referred to uh, George Mastin. George Mastin was a local theater impresario who um, did something astonishing. Um, what he did immediately after the trial was commission some local artists to paint enormous paintings. And by enormous, I mean like the size of a wall enormous canvases of the murders. And then what Mastin did was he created a traveling show where he would put hit these, um, he would put these, these paintings, roll them up, put them in a wagon, take them to a town, put them up in um, some sort of a space. It could be, um, it could be a, a town hall, it could be um, a, ho a, mot a hotel, um, it could be a museum. He would put them up and then he would do this nighttime performance where he would hold up a candelabra to show the details of the painting. And as he was holding up this candelabra, he would narrate the story. So it was sort of proto-filmic. It was like an early film before film had been invest invented. And uh, while he was making this dramatic nighttime performance, um, there would be uh, melodramatic music playing. So uh, he performed this uh, this show in different uh, some different forms on and off. He performed it for a half century. So he was going all over New York State performing this story, and it was apparently um, a very shocking and and striking story that um, people talked about decades afterwards. They would remember it because it was such a um, such a powerful performance. So, and his, the way he told the story, it was very much the um, the prosecution's version of the story. So basically, uh, William Freeman was very simply a monster. He was a monster because he was um, a monster, and he was a monster because of his race in this um, libelous story. And, um, and that was the story that white people all over New York State paid to hear for half a century. It appealed to them. It, they, it was giving them something that they wanted to hear and um, that they were willing to pay for. So these are a couple of examples. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the Black community was devastated by these events. You know, you have to remember that William Freeman was part of the founding Black uh, family. And he had committed this um, horrible, atrocious act. So... The black community was differently devastated by this um, by this crime, and um, they had to figure out how to live afterwards. They had to figure out how to come back together afterwards. And one of the things that they did was um, um, uh, use the crime as an excuse to raise money for a black school. Uh, during the trial, the prosecution, uh, excuse me, the the defense had argued that one of the ways that Freeman had been racially discriminated against was that he had been excluded from school and that this was a problem, which of course it was a problem, but it did not cause the murders. Um, so afterwards, um, the black community, which was centered on the AME church, got together and went to people like Austin who had been arguing, uh, making this argument about schools. And they basically said, you blamed Freeman's crimes on the lack of schools give us money so we can build some schools for black children. Um, and previously there had been an attempt to build schools for black children previously and white people had, um, had forced those schools to close in racist acts. And now the black community reorganized and again raised money for a black school and this time did it successfully. Yeah, and one of the, the legacy of Freeman it, um, never touches prison reform. It touches voting in New York State, but not prison reform. So um, just briefly talk about how it um, helped disenfranchise Black voting 
And then also, if we could kind of wrap up on this carceral lesson learned and where where you came out as so abolitionist. Sure. So, um, so black men had had the right to vote in New York State, and uh, black women had not. But um, women of all races had not had the right to vote. But black men had had the right to vote in New York State, and then in 1821 there was um, an amendment made in the New York State Constitution that actively took away the right to vote for almost all black men. It attached a property require requirement for voting for black men, but no other men. So this act basically disenfranchised almost all black men in 1821. Um, the question of the uh, New York State Constitution was coming back for a vote in the fall of 1846, which was just a few months after William Freeman committed this crime. And um, so it was going up for a popular vote, and there had been enormous Black organizing around this measure for decades. Uh, Black people, men and women, had been organizing to amend the Constitution ever since 1821. They had put enormous effort into this. And then the murders and the um, and the, the, the story making around the murders was a terrible blow to this effort. And in um, November, 1846, um, the amendment failed and um, black men remained um, uh, disenfranchised in New York state. So this was, this was, this was awful. Uh, this was crushing. It was absolutely crushing to the black community in New York. Um, and there was a relationship to William Freeman. I mean, certainly he was not the only cause, but it, he, it, it, it was part of the story that has been lost. And I'm restoring that part of the story. So one of the things that struck me is um, right at the end of the book, you, you point out that Auburn existed 50 years before the 13th Amendment. Yeah. And this prison for profit and this re-enslaving, we could call it, of mm -hmm. free people, um, mm -hmm. existed prior to Reconstruction and uh, mm -hmm. all, redemption, all that kind of stuff. So how did you learn that? And how do you land after this book with a different perspective on prisons? Sure. Well, before I started working on this book, I believed, like many Americans, that um, prison for profit was basically a product of the postbellum South, that it was um, the, the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution passed in 1865 states that there will be no slavery except as a punishment for crime. And for a lot of people, that has led them to believe that the 13th Amendment basically allowed slavery by another name after the Civil War. Um, and so I, I I believed that too before I started this research. And what, what William Freeman's story shows very clearly is that um, slavery by another name was invented not in the South after the Civil War, not in the South after slavery was eradicated in the South. It was invented in the North 50 years before the 13th Amendment, long before the um, before the Civil War, but it was invented in the wake of, of Northern slavery rather than Southern slavery. Northern slavery, slavery in New York State, was being gradually um, eradicated starting in 1790. Well, it had one start in 1799. It, 1799 was an important moment in one wave of gradual emancipation. And the Auburn State Prison was slavery by another name in the North. And by the way, they did use the word slavery. Um, people who were incarcerated in the Auburn State Prison were called slaves of the state. So it was explicit. It was absolutely explicit. And so one of the things I learned, um, what I realized was that by focusing on slave on, on slavery by another name, carceral slavery in the South, what that has done is it's let the North off the hook. One of the one of my goals in this book was to put the North back on the hook. 
I want the whole world to know that um, slave, uh, that prison for profit in the United States was developed, instituted, invented in the North 50 years before the 13th Amendment, and that it spread from the North. So we can look at prisons like San Quentin in California. San Quentin was built on Auburn's model. And that's just one of the examples. There are prisons all over the United States and all over the world to this day that were built on Auburn's model. And it was a New York State invention.